Well, good morning out there. Welcome to another beautiful day that the Lord has made. We should do exactly what He has said in His Word. We should rejoice and be glad in it. And we are happy to be here today. <clears throat> Hope you're doing well. And if you're not doing well, I'll give you the secret of how to live powerfully, and that's by the Word of God. Use the Word of God. You'll be a superman or a superwoman when you begin to pronounce the Word of God over your situations. Today, <clears throat> here at Calvary Assembly of God Church, Pastor Gary Phillips sitting behind his desk, well-fed, well-relaxed, <clears throat> continuing a study in spiritual authority. And we are studying today on why men should obey delegated authority. And, and obviously the first answer would be because God told us to. And we have two scriptures today. <clears throat> Write them down. Get out your Bible and look, look for yourself. The first scripture is taken from Romans 13.1. Let every soul, notice it says, let every soul, that encompasses you and me, be subject to the authorities that are above them, above them or him. For there is no authority except from God. So that's pretty succinct. All authorities stem from God. He is the, he is the head. What he says goes. <clears throat> but there's a second scripture in 1 Peter 2, 13, 14. And that scripture says, be subject. In other words, obey, be under control. Be subject to every ordinance of man. For the Lord's sake, <clears throat> we do it because God has asked us to, whether to the king as supreme or unto governors as sent by him for vengeance on evildoers or for praise to them that do well. The word very clearly surmises all that. So it pays to be under the authority of God. So we begin with the fact, <clears throat> the supreme fact, that God is the source of all authorities in the universe. If, if you ever question and you say to yourself, where do these authorities come from? They come from God. Now since all governing authorities are instituted by Him, by God, <clears throat> then all authorities are delegated by Him, by God, and represent His authority. So they're not representing their authority or their power. They're representing God's authority, His power. God Himself has established this system of authority in order to manifest Himself. God functions through authority, <clears throat> through, through the submission to His authority. Wherefore, people encounter authority and when they do that, they really are meeting God. It is possible for men to come to know God through His presence. But even without His presence, they can still know Him through His authority. We, we, we just have to look around and see the authority of God, the power of God. See it through creation, nature. See, see it through His very Word. In the Garden of Eden, men knew God through His presence. They walked and talked, obviously, with God. They fellowshiped with Him. <clears throat> During His absence, by remembering His command, that's how they knew who God was. Let me go on here. Today, through men, though men, seldom by remembering His command, today, <clears throat> though men seldom encounter God directly, in this world, even though you hear men sing all the time, they hear God, they see God, they talk to God. This does not apply to those in church who live constantly in the Spirit. There are some religious people that that's all they talk about. Always in the Spirit, in the Spirit. For the, for, and, the, and that they often see God face to face. The Bible says no one has ever seen God and lived. So where they come up with this, I do not know. The image of God is seen in Jesus. He, he, the physical side of God, reveals God. 
The place today where he manifests himself the most is in his commands. His commandments tell you who he is, where he is, and what he is about. Only those who are foolish, <clears throat> like the foolish tenants, let me, let me get this lesson apart. In the parables, especially in Mark 12, 1 through 9, have to have the personal presence of the owner of the vineyard in order to obey. You read that story, Mark 12, 1 through 9. For in the story are not the servants of his son sent ahead of him as his representative. They were delegated authority. They came to collect the, their owner's part of the vineyard. <clears throat> Those who are set up by God are to exercise authority for him. They're simply working for God. They're acting on his behalf. Since all governing authorities are ordained and instituted by God, they are meant to be obeyed. If we would indeed learn how to obey God, we would learn then how to have absolutely no trouble recognizing on whom God's authority rests. That's the problem. We see them as a human being, a failing sometimes human being, an abrasive unruly, we don't see the authority they represent. But if we know only God's direct authority, and that's what they were saying, we will only receive God, the, the true owner of this vineyard, no one that represents him, indirect authority. We, we may have possibly violated more than half of his authority. Upon how many lives can we identify the authority of God? Is there any room for us to choose between God's direct authority and his delegated authority? The answer is no. We must be subject to delegated authority as well as to God's direct authority. <clears throat> See, people don't seem to have a problem submitting to uh, a senior pastor. But woe unto a junior minister, an associate pastor. The gatekeeper, the gate, the, the, the guy who unlocks and locks the gate, the helper, the minister of helps. For there is no authority except from God. <clears throat> There's no other way to view it. And if you try to find a way to view it, you're going to go into rebellion. And you may have already gone into rebellion. And you leave God no choice but to deal with your rebellion. And believe me, he's going to deal with it. As to earthly authorities, Paul not only exhorts positively towards subjection, but also warns negatively against resistance. We've studied and studied and studied on the cost of rebellion in the Old Testament. Judas is a great example of rebellion in the New Testament. He ended up killing himself, hanging himself. He, he was so miserable. So, and, and so we, the Bible is full of examples on how God hates, resists. You know, people tell me, I, I got a, a let, um, inquiry from someone, wh who, where is my Jesus, they said. Where is the love? As if Jesus loves everything that's going on in the world. Jesus, a, a God very clearly said openly, I hate seven things. God is capable of, of hating and destroying and destruction. I don't know where this person dreamt up that God is pure love to the point that he allows anything and everything in the world. You may be in a lifestyle that God says is an abomination to him. That doesn't sound like love to me. He who resists the authorities, listen to this, resists God's own command. He who rejects God's delegated authority rejects God's own authority. It doesn't matter what you're rebelling against. Delegated are, are direct. 
authority according to the Bible is characterized by a unique nature. There is no authority except from God. He who resists authority resists God. And those who resist will incur judgment. That's what you're missing here. You're assuming, because we 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 practice sloppy agape all the time. Oh, I, I've asked God to forgive me for my rebellion. You gotta you gotta give up your rebellion. Stop your rebellion. There is no possibility of rebellion without judgment. Know that today. The consequences of resisting authority is death. Man has no choice in the matter of authority when it comes to God. You have no choice. It's not of your choosing. It's of your choosing to rebel, but you're going to pay the price for that. During Adam's time, God gave men dominion over the whole earth. What they were to govern, however, were the living creatures. After the flood, God handed the power of governing man's fellow man to Noah, over to Noah, who was faithful to God, who obeyed God. hundred years in building the ark that saved his family and started the world over again. Mocked for a hundred years, laughed at for a hundred years. Stating that whoso sheddeth man's blood by man, shall his blood be shed. You find that in Genesis, Genesis the ninth chapter and the sixth verse. From then on, the authority of governing man was invested in men. That's why Jesus had to come as a man and die for our sins. A man caused sin and brought sin down on every one of his subjects, those that were born of his tainted blood. Ever since then, there has, become, there has been human government under which men are placed. After having led his people out of Egypt into wilderness, God gave them the Ten Commandments. And along with that, he gave many ordinances. Among these was one which declared, Thou shalt not revile God, nor curse a ruler of thy people. You find that in Exodus 22, 28. This proves conclusively that God has put them under rulers. We're under authorities, whether we like it or not. Some we may favor, some we may find distasteful, but we're under their authority, whether we like it or not. Even in Moses' time, <clears throat> the leaders who resisted authority were actually resisting God, and we read about how God dealt with them. Some died by strange fire, some the ground opened up and swallowed them. A whole nation was attacked by a plague. Maybe that ought to cause us to consider what we're enduring right now. The rulers of the nations did not believe in God, and their countries were under the dominion of Satan. The principle of authority remained unchanged. Doesn't matter, God is still over the authorities. Jesus, as Israel, was God's kingdom and king. David was chosen by God, so the Persian Empire was likewise said to have been set up by God. They were, a, they were an evil, ungodly kingdom. When our Lord was on earth, he was subject to the governing authorities as well as to the authority of the high priest. They cheated and lied. They, they, they tried Jesus five times illegally. Yet Jesus paid taxes, taught men to render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. You find that in Matthew twenty-two twenty-one. 21. I hope you're taking these scriptures down. During questioning, when the high priest adjured him by the living God to tell whether he was Christ, the Son of God, the Lord immediately obeyed in Matthew 26, 63, 64. This acknowledgement in all these instances that they were the authorities on earth. Our Lord was never a party to any rebellion. <clears throat> Paul shows us in Romans 13, I just read it, 
that all men are in authority and are God's servants, especially we who serve him, have accepted him. We must be subject to the local authority under which we live, as well as the authority to our own nation and race. We should not disobey local authority simply because we may be of a different nationality. The law is not a terror to good conduct, it's a terror to bad conduct. However different the laws of nations are, they are all derived from the law of God. The basic principle of all God's laws is to punish the evil and reward the good. All powers have their own laws. Their function is to maintain and execute their laws that the good may be approved and the bad disciplined. They do not bear the sword in vain. That's clearly stated in the Bible. In spite of the fact that some powers do exalt evil and suppress good, and we openly admit that because Satan is over the power of the earth. They have to resort to distortion by calling the evil good and the good evil. And they're doing that today. What, what's up is down. What's left is right. What's good is bad. What's bad is good. They dare not come out openly and declare that the evil person is exalted of his wickedness while the good one is chastised because of his goodness. Up to the present powers, they are still following, at least in principle, the rule of rewarding the good and punishing the bad. <clears throat> I'm going to close with our lesson for today. This principle has not been changed. Therefore, the law of God remains in force. In other words, submission and authority is still in vogue today. It still exists today. Direct authority and indirect authority. You will be confronted by it. You will face it. Some you will like, some you will not like. But it reveals who you are and what you are in the sight of God. And, and you must learn to submit. The day shall come when the lawless one who is a, the Antichrist shall be in power. That, that seven-year tribulation period is going to be hell on earth. <clears throat> he then will distort the entire concept of submission and authority. He's going to want you to submit to him. I pray to God <clears throat> that you escape the, the great tribulation by being caught away in a thing we call the rapture, taken from the Latin, catching away, caught up. You say, is that possible? It is if you know Jesus as your personal Savior. I recommend at this very moment we stop with a concluding prayer. Pray it with me. Sinner friend of mine, pray this prayer with me. Paul, in the book of Romans, says if you will confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead, you shall be saved. Make that commitment today. Lord Jesus, I need a Savior. I am out of line. I can't save myself. I've come to that conclusion. Please, save me from myself, most of all. Forgive me. Forgive me of my sins, my thoughts. Temptation is not sin, but maybe you're fighting temptation right now. Take Jesus into your heart. Use the Word of God to, def to defeat the enemy. You can do all things through Christ which strengthens you. So say this with me, Lord Jesus, I accept you today as my Lord and my Savior. I, I willingly, openly invite you to come into my heart, mind, and spirit and possess me. Possess me. Own me. I want to become your servant. So I make that declaration today. I make that commitment to you today. This is the beginning of my new life. Now I understand what it is to be born anew. To be born again. You, you can't be born physically again. You born, you're born again spiritually. You're made a, a new creature in Christ when you prayed that prayer today. 
So now, get yourself a good study Bible. I hope you could find a church that teaches and preaches the Word of God. Attend that church. There's reason for you to attend church. You can, you, you, you can practice what God wants you to practice in a church in a way that you can't when you sit at home and just watch me. I'm glad you're watching me, but find a church. If you don't have a church and you live near us, come to Calvary Assembly. You'll love it. You, you'll immediately say, wow, this, this is something I should have done years ago. My grandfather, who died in his 90s, said his greatest regret in life was that he didn't find Jesus earlier in his life. He found Jesus, and he's in heaven today, but he, he was sad because he waited so long. You didn't wait. You prayed that prayer today. I welcome you into the kingdom of God. May you be greatly blessed, healed, prospered. In Jesus' name, see you tomorrow.